Hello, hello, hello. Oh, here we go. I got something. You live? I got something. Test, test, there we go. That was my fault, and I'm a conference guy too. Um, <laughs> There's plenty of room out the front. Yeah, <laughs> come on up. And we're also guy. far back. We're nice people, really. Um, so this is the state of App Nation, and um, I am Drew Ayani. I run a conference series called App Nation and a new conference called the Chief Digital Officer Summit, which is coming up later in November in Silicon Valley. Some of you may know, remember App Nation. Um, in our first year, we came to Atlanta and did an App Nation Atlanta. Uh, conference at uh, Georgia Tech and we had a great show and it's great to be back in Atlanta I thank the chamber for having me here um, I've been in digital for almost 20 years and always have found Atlanta to be a just an incredibly digitally savvy you know city and region really which is why I brought my app nation conference here a couple years ago and look forward to coming back so it's always great to be here see some old familiar faces um, and it's great meeting some new folks as well. So we have quite a bit of time, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a quick sort of tee up of the state of App Nation, um, and then we're gonna get to a great uh, panel here, and we definitely wanna get to your questions, so think about some questions. We're gonna have a roving mic, um, and I'm gonna hope my little clicker advances here. Um, so I'm gonna set this up sort of from top line and get a little more narrow as we get towards apps, but I wanna kind of just put some stats up and some slides in regards to you know, where we've been from a personal computing platform standpoint over the last, well, I don't know, this chart is almost 40 <laughs> years now, and, and you know, lots has been discussed about the demise of, or the, the, the slow demise of Wintel. And I think what's interesting here is, remember, this is, um, <laughs> see, I like this. You, you can Just to see. I'll, I'll, These I'll are great panelists right here. Yeah. And two I, I, could I, I care less and two like, you know, <laughs> very, very engaged. Um, so this is personal computing platforms, right? So again, this isn't just sort of, you know, desktop operating systems. You know, personal computing platforms. And you want to know what's happening to Wintel. Just look at what's happening in regards to the mobile revolution turning into the personal computing platforms of most of us. It's not just about desktop or laptop, right? So really this sort of sets up what's been happening over the last 40 years, but then sets up what's just been happening in the last five, which is really quite remarkable. Um, now we will talk specifically about smartphone operating, operating system market share uh, since 2005 on the left to 2012. And again, you know, the story uh, is pretty clear in terms of what's happened here. Um, if anything, we're waiting on sort of what happens with Windows Phone. Right now, I'd argue we pretty much are in a duopoly. If you look at it from the app developer's perspective, it still is iOS and, uh, and Android. And, you know, I would say with Microsoft, it's jury still out. I mean, that's, I don't think um, their prospects are dim or bad, but they're neither, they're not, they're not bright either. So uh, with the new regime there, I think it'll be very interesting to, uh, to see what happens with Microsoft. Um, you know, and this is, you know, as we start to talk about the, the opportunity with apps and just to put some things in perspective, this app revolution has happened with roughly now about a billion and a half smartphones out there. Um, and it is overwhelming in terms of st the statistics, in terms of the number of downloads of apps and, and just how big this market is now. But at the same time, we've got another four or five billion smartphones to tap into as the market grows over the next four to five years out into emerging markets. And everything will more or less be a smartphone as we define it today, probably within two or three years. So if we think the market is big now, as huge as it is, and even hard to get your arms around the numbers, you know, exponential growth to come. Uh, and, you know, this is smartphones, this isn't tablets, right? So you, you may have just as, you may have half that many tablets out there by that time, uh, which is still a massive number. Um, so, and, and again, to, to reinforce the tablet point, um, you know, if we look at the first 12 quarters of cumulative unit shipments of, ta of iPad versus iPhone, more iPads, right? So, you know, again, don't forget about tablets as we talk about the app revolution and we talk about smartphones. Smartphones is the obvious one to focus on. And you know, we haven't talked about emerging platforms, TVs, connected devices, wearable tech. You know, apps have to be developed for all of these. So really, if we think it's big now, um, you know, just, just wait and see. 
Um, again, the growth of tablets. We thought the growth of smartphones was fast. You know, this is the growth rate of tablets versus desktop notebook and versus phones. Right? So the blue line is notebook PCs, the green line is desktop PCs, the orange line on the right is tablet growth in terms of market share penetration. Why do you see dips the holidays? Right? So after the holidays are over, there's always a dip. Right? So this is you know, pretty fascinating. Again, I guess the message here through the last few slides is don't forget about tablets when we're talking about the app revolution. Um, again, tablet smartphone growth, a little bit more of a specific one, smartphone on the left, tablet on the right, and sort of projection. This is roughly right at the beginning of the year, so we probably have crossed over there. Um, but again, pretty, uh, pretty significant. So what does this all mean in regards to app downloads? Um, well, this is a cumulative, not an annual number, right? So this is a cumulative number. Uh, this year we'll go over about 100 billion app downloads cumulatively in the last four plus years, four and a half since the I, Apple's you know, store opened. Um, and again, you know, pretty steady growth up through you know, by 2017, adding anywhere from 30 to 40 and getting up to 50 billion sort of app downloads per year and getting to a cumulative number of you know, maybe half a trillion apps downloaded by 2017. Um, pretty remarkable. Um, you know, this is sort of a good news, bad news slide for developers in the sense of, you know, we have a million apps in the Apple Store, maybe three quarters of a million in Android, maybe a few hundred thousand in Windows. Um, and we have all these users around the world, right? A billion and a half going to five billion. You know, yes, it's good that we're using and launching more apps per day, but this would be a lot more encouraging if we were going from like 7.2 to 14. You know, so it's, it's not that many more that we're adding per day, but so many more apps coming into the marketplace, which is why our App Nation conference, all we focus on is, is discovery and monetization for developers. You know, just because the discovery exercise is so, so difficult and so challenging, particularly if you're a smaller developer. I know there's some uh, larger companies in the house here and even app discovery for larger companies. Uh, the competition is, is stiff out there. Um, so I'm gonna do this really quick. I'm gonna do a poll, but as we get to some more slides, people always ask, can I get the deck? So if you want the deck, that's my email. Write it down, I'm gonna put it up again at the end. I just wanna take a quick poll as well and find out who's in the audience. So if you're from an agency, raise your hand. Brands, media entertainment companies, content, and tools, technology, platform, and investors. Okay, so it's a pretty good mix. Um, so that was entirely gratuitous so we could find out and then also put the email up. Um, so let's dig in a little bit into so App Nation and, and the state of App Nation. Um, at my conference, we talk a lot about HTML5 mobile web versus native apps. We don't shy away from the discussion. Um, and people say to me, well, Drew, is it native app? Is it mobile web? What is it? Well, it's not a zero-sum game, first of all. But at the same time, it is still an app-dominated world in the mobile environment, native app. You know, HTML5 and the technical capabilities of HTML5, and we got some great folks on the agency and the development side can talk about what their clients are asking for. But I'll tell you what consumers are, are asking for, at least saying that they like apps. You know, they don't, they're not begging for the mobile web. They don't want to type web addresses in, right? So now the apps ultimately may be hybrid and there may be HTML5 behind the app. But the point is that consumers are going to look to get those buttons on their phones or their tablets in the same way that they are trained to get apps. They don't want to type in web addresses. So regardless of what's behind that little tile on your phone, consumers have strong, strongly endorsed, obviously, at 100 billion downloads in four years, that they like you know, native apps. Um, this is interesting from a company called Flurry, which many of you know, and they're great partners of ours, and they put out great research. They track, they're an analytics company, they track a, about a billion smartphones, uh, developers use their analytics tools, and they track about a billion unique devices globally, and track one trillion app events a month. So an app event could be I turn it on, I could swipe it, I could be playing a game. Um, and they did a, a study with Comscore, and coming from the agency world, you know, this is a, this is a major deal, and, and what you don't see is December 2012 is the right column here. So I would argue that by the end of this year, Average time spent across all demographics in apps will match television. You know, now if you're at an agency and, and we know how television dominates the media and advertising world, you know, this is a huge, huge shift, especially when you consider it's only been about four years. So in terms of where the money's going and where the money should be going, we're now having this same old argument that we had 10 years ago about people who were fighting for online dollars like I was as, at an agency. Hey, people are spending more time online but we're not getting the dollars. Well, we're having that conversation at an order of magnitude with mobile in terms of time spent, and it's happening so fast. 
Um, so just it's December 2010, December 2011, December 2012 uh, in terms of minutes per day. Um, so this goes from 5 a.m. to 4 a.m. Um, interestingly enough, uh, day parting, we talk a lot about in the media business about you know, when people are using or when people are watching particular programs. You know, pretty closely matches television actually in regards to sort of consumption of apps in regards to the time per day, um, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, hourly usage by gender, again going from five in the morning to four in the morning, males and females. Um, I'm an old analyst as well, I was at Jupiter in the 90s. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this means in terms of why. Um, we can all have our own theories and, and opinions about um, why there are a couple huge sort of discrepancies in terms of why males and females are online or you know, consuming apps at, at different times at greater rates. Um, but again, you know, so again, if you're looking to reach certain demographics at certain times of the day, you know, this is uh, an interesting chart from an insight point of view. Um, so, you know, app discovery, just a brief, this is from our own research actually, and I also have a research uh, deck that I can send you from, from App Nation. Um, goes from word of mouth, app store reviews, download rank media, new and notable, ads, screenshots, existing, you know, kind of like the internet of old, word of mouth. You know, nothing, nothing's really changed. Um, app store reviews, you know, it's about earned media in terms of people finding your app, especially if you're a, a, a smaller developer and you're, you're fighting in this sort of sea of apps, if you will. Um, this is uh, out to 2012, so it's a little dated, so I'm sure these lines have crossed. You know, we talk about US display online advertising, which is a portion of the overall online sort of uh, advertising number. Search is the other big one, of course. But by now, we're probably at virtual goods surpassing US display online advertising. Um, pretty remarkable. Again, it's, it's really the growth and the speed, actually, which is as, as much the story here as, as the size, if you will. Um, and just a couple sort of uh, verticals in terms of the growth. Um, this is daily number of photos uploaded and shared on select platforms. Um, so you see where we've gone from uh, you know, uh, 2005 out now to 2013, again, with Flickr, Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, you know, pretty, pretty remarkable in terms of the, the, the number of photos that are being uploaded, you know, literally per day. Um, same thing for video. This goes from June 2007 to May 2013. Hours of video uploaded um, per minute. Um, so 100 hours every minute being uploaded. Um, so just multiply it out and you can, you can really see what's going on. The final slide before we get to the, you know, what does this all mean in regards to the overall sort of market sizing of the app economy? And this is really what we look at sort of from a, from a business and app economy standpoint. You know, we, we say it's about a $60 billion economy. This is a US number, by the way, out to um, 152 probably by, and this includes, um, so at the bottom here we have, it's in-app advertising is the blue, the green is sales of physical goods and services, so actual commerce. Um, virtual goods is the turquoise, the red is paid app downloads, and the purple is digital downloads, that would be like iTunes or, or downloading. And again, I can get you all the, the deck if you want it. So, you know, really when you consider that, you know, this, this was at a standing start of zero in 2008, um, to think that we've got to a $60 billion market in five years and, you know, uh, roughly a $150 billion market in less than 10. Uh, it, you know, it, it really is staggering. And, and the numbers may continue to grow exponentially if we're talking about the app economy as it relates to tablets and as it relates to wearable technology, connected TVs, cars, and all these other platforms that developers are going to be developing apps for. People are going to be buying apps, downloading apps, buying products and services through these apps, buying virtual goods. This number may be small in five, 10 years. We may look back and go, you know, that, that, was, a, that was a relatively small number. So again, that's the, uh, the email really quick. Um, and uh, I'll send you the deck and they'll also send you our state of the app economy research report, which has a little bit more uh, detail. So we're gonna get right to the panel here um, and I'm gonna have everybody sort of go down the line and introduce themselves. Um, where they are, what they're doing, and um, if you can also sort of say what's top of mind for you right now. You read an article today, you saw something last night, you were on an app this morning that you thought was pretty cool. Um, you know, what's just top of mind as you're uh, on an everyday basis? And Dave, we'll start with you. Cool. So I broke my cardinal rule and I sat beside the moderator. So <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, I'm Dave Rollo, I'm the SVP of Rockfish. We're a digital in innovations partner. Uh, some of our clients are Walmart, Sam's Club, Johnson & Johnson, Ford, Kraft, uh, snack food brands, et cetera. Um, 
Let's see, what keeps me up? I mean, simply it's simplicity and privacy. So I think apps offer you know, the simplicity to make our lives better, easier. Um, like, I like to pay my Amex bill now because that app is so clean. Um, privacy, I think that the, the company that um, thinks about my privacy first you know, gets my download first. So that's my perspective. Carl? Uh, Carl Newton. I'm a director of technology for Slalom Consulting here in Atlanta. Um, our clients, I'll talk about ones locally, most of them Coca-Cola, AT&T, IHG, Delta, Home Depot. Um, I, I kind of feel overdressed actually for this panel, but, I, but I, just so I try and get some degree of cool card, I, I do wear some kind of funky socks and I, I have penguins on today, so maybe that gives me some credibility. Uh, what keeps me up at night? Um, pr probably the, the, the biggest thing I, I can think about right now would be kind of omni-channel experience for customers and, and just the, uh, with such a plethora of devices out there and, and the Internet of Things driving different concepts of how there will be a relationship between the company and, a, and its customers, the, the idea of really understanding how do you give a consistent experience to that customer um, that isn't going to, to drive them away. My name is Michael Tavani. I'm one of the founders of Scout Mob. We are uh, an Atlanta-based uh, company. Uh, most people probably know us um, through our mobile app. We have a local mobile app which has kind of local incentives at restaurants and retail stores. And uh, just about a year ago, we launched a second product which is a big, a big piece of our uh, thinking going forward which is a, an e-commerce product. Uh, it's called Shop and we're selling uh, handmade, kind of inspired, authentic uh, products, goods. Um, and uh, I guess what keeps me up at night, so I, I lead our product team, so all the products that come out of Scout Mob is, is my team. And uh, I think a lot about uh, delighting consumers. That's, that's been something that we've thought uh, a lot about every step of the way. And so I kind of stay up late at night thinking about how do we continue to delight consumers um, in kind of a frictionless way to create, uh, you know, uh, ultimately a great experience. And my name is Kevin Planofsky. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and I lead the sort of account strategy for a uh, full service digital agency here in town called Vert. Um, we focus on sort of mobile first strategy, uh, custom solutions, uh, and you know, sort of a mobile social engagement focus for primarily uh, B2C brands. Uh, we do a lot of work with Taco Mac and IHG and the weather company. Um, we did some work with uh, Scout Mob back in the day, and uh, I'm really excited to be on the panel with uh, wearing flip-flops, because that uh, will set us apart, so thank you for holding that down. And um, these days, I I'm super jazzed about location, because our focus has always been uh, the intersection of mobile and social. So, uh, you know, this device and being able to compute anywhere and uh, how that expands your social network and enriches it. And I feel like location uh, awareness and relevance and a lot of that serendipity and surprising you know, happens at that intersection. And um, so, so that's probably one of the most exciting, especially for you know, B2C brick and mortar brands that we work with. Great, and I'd, I'd like to jump into sort of the operating system discussion as well as native app and mobile web. And, and Michael, I'm gonna start with you just in terms of developing you know, product. Um, if from a mobile perspective, is it a, an iOS, Android world? Where is Windows sort of you know, fall on your radar right now? Um, and you know, anything else on the horizon? And then we can you know, lead, you know, bring in the mobile web into that if you like as well. Yeah, so yes, it's all iOS, Android. We don't think for a second about Windows. Um, and BlackBerry, it's funny, we developed an app for them you know, a year and a half ago that was terrible. And obviously we don't even think about, I mean literally we haven't even touched it in a year, it might not even be working right now. So we don't think about anything else. I think <laughs> I was one of the people that was like yelling, <laughs> screaming for that um, back in the day. So all those two, mobile web is definitely a big element. 40% of our revenue comes from email. So uh, we think a lot about entry points into our, the ecosystem and so, Email is kind of our, is a push driver for us. So, so you know, those people aren't all, not all of them are gonna have, um, you know, our native apps. So, we, so that's where we think about kind of the, the mobile web side. Um, originally, we were just timing wise, we were probably uh, six months behind on Android. And I think that window is now probably three months. So we still lead with, with, um, with iOS. Um, it's more consistent screen size and, and all that. Um, and it's a, you know, I gotta be honest, I think it's, it's for our developers, it's 
they, it's a little sexier for them to start there and then kind of you yeah, know, duplicate sure. that on And are you Android. seeing in terms of the trends, in terms of actual numbers of users downloading Android versus the iOS yeah. app, where are we right now, like literally? So a time? year ago, we were 70-30, 70, 70 being yeah. iOS and 30 being Android, but that, that number is, is shrinking. So it's probably 60-40 now. Um, and that's, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's both users and revenue, so it, and those lines break pretty evenly. Right, right. Rest of the panel, you know, in native versus mobile web. And we'll talk about native quickly. Anyone jump in from sort of the agency development side? Is it still an iOS, Android world? And well, do you do you see anything else? Microsoft, anything else? On yeah, the I, you know, I was I was up in New York for Advertising Week last week, and I sat on a panel that was <clears throat> uh, director, president of Conan Wolf and their client Nokia. Yeah. And if anybody was there, uh, I kind of got a, a, a tiny little spark lit for what Nokia and Windows is doing. I never would have guessed that. Um, but I, you know, I think the philosophy behind what they're trying to do is powerful. I think they've just got a branding issue. Uh, people, branding is just so powerful. People love the most valuable company in the world now, Apple, uh, brand in the world. Um, and, you know, and, and Android right behind just with the, the model of, of that free distribution uh, won out. And, they have an uphill battle, but I do think there's something magical. I think Nokia has always made good hardware. They started this, this smartphone craze. They just lost their footing along the way. And you know, our clients are focused. Uh, they're focused on iOS and Android right now. They want the people. Um, and it is cro it's cross-platform experiences. It's, it's not only just iOS and Android. It's also uh, yeah. the mobile web, and it's, it's the tablet web, and it's, and it's iOS and Android for tablet and the, difference in the, in the differentiators there. It becomes more than just two platforms almost. Carl and David, same thing to you, iOS versus Android, Microsoft, and then how the yeah. mobile web fits in. I certainly think with, if you get out of the pure sort of consumer space, when you start looking at interaction with enterprise, um, with enterprise companies, where, whether it's you know, paying your Amex bill, or kind of going online to AT&T and looking at your services, there, is a, there isn't a one size fits all answer. And you, you certainly have to think about the customer experience. What are they trying to do? And is a native app the right method to allow them to do that from a functional mm -hmm. perspective? Or do you need to drive them into something that's, uh, um, that might be more enriching and, and more feature rich um, as, and tied into the back end systems a bit easier? I, I think with Microsoft, the interesting thing is that they're kind of moving into the, almost this vertical integration, which Apple has dominated for so long. That was Apple's model. And frankly, Apple are the only one that's done it well. The reason that they are that, that kind of number one company is, is I say, it's brand. And I think Microsoft trying almost, they, are, they have a challenge by, with the acquisition of Nokia, they move into vertical integration of hardware and software, but at the same time, they have to keep their OEMs happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that combined with their brand challenges at times is going to be a difficult um, proposition for them over yeah. time. But um, you know, we'll, we'll see how they play out. But it's it certainly, as a platform, it's not relevant right now. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of toe the same line. I agree with everything that's being said, but it's also been you know, my rule of thumb that third place is a pretty good place to be in, yeah. right? Um, the one and two are fighting you know, for, for supremacy. Third, you know, people aren't considering them. So they have a little bit more of, uh, of a leeway to, to really activate you know, a shift that is different, that can be compelling, but they do. They have to solve some of the brand, the brand problems. You know, they're making a good push now um, that is different than in years past towards more of a consumer place, mm -hmm. with them opening up, you know, stores in Lenox Mall and, and, and around the country. So it's not going to be something overnight, but I definitely don't count them out. They're too big, they're too smart, and you know what? They're not crippled by the one-two battle that's happening between Android and iOS. So you're not ruling them out completely. You think not at all. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting if you look at <clears throat> Nokia and Microsoft. The problem with Microsoft, it's a lot of it's the chicken and the egg, right? You know, if you have the consumers, then you have the phones out there, then the developers will develop for it. Yeah, if right. you don't, then they won't. But how do you get the phones out there if they don't have the apps, right? It's the classic sort of chicken and, and egg. And one of yeah. the cool things that they were talking about is they were defending that big uh, when I, on the panel, and it was the, the reality that you know, you want your Gmail, you want your Scout Mob, you want your Weather app, you want your uh, Foursquare, whatever. And at some point, you know, these billions and billions of app downloads uh, start to be noise or not as valuable. And, as, and, and their focus right now is, you know, and they do, they have the big ones. And, sure. 
It's an, it's an interesting play. Well, yeah, and if you look at Nokia, I mean, look, Nokia in certain markets, just like BlackBerry, everyone wants to rip them apart, and right. clearly they've had their issues. They're very strong in certain markets. In BlackBerry in Indonesia, Nokia in India, I mean, you know, there are pockets where they're very strong, so it's not like let's just give up on them. And, and we'll see what happens. Microsoft has another interesting story where I deal a lot with their developer relations groups, right? And, and trying to get them to come to the conference and talk about their message. Their message is so disjointed. You know, they had different developer relations groups for Windows 8 and then a different group for Windows 8 Mobile and then a different group for .NET on the enterprise side. They didn't, Xbox and Microsoft don't even really talk to each other. They hate each other. Where if they put a Windows story together and a Windows plus Xbox story, like Windows on desktop, Windows on mobile, Xbox, and get the developers to see the broader global distribution possibilities across all of Microsoft's platforms, they actually have a pretty interesting and compelling story. And use the sexiness of Xbox, which has a lot of uh, street cred with the gamers, and half the industry is gaming, 40%. Right? So they need to leverage Xbox as a Trojan horse, get the developers in the family, and then start to talk about the global sort of distribution. And they are combining now the Windows 8 and Windows 8 mobile app developer relations groups. So maybe from the developer relations side, it might happen, but they can have that all set. If they don't sell the phones, <laughs> then it ultimately doesn't matter. So that's the toughest challenge for it's, them. It's definitely a balance yeah. between consumer and developers. People yeah. forget about the developers, <clears throat> and it's, it's not a, the app game is not how many 99 cent downloads can I get anymore, right? It's a bigger game than that. They want stake in it. If they're gonna develop a cool app you know, that uh, allows them and leverages, you know, API hook-ins, say, from Amazon to buy fitness equipment better and easier and faster and whatever, just to make something up. Yeah. Um, the developer is going to look for 5%, 10 uh, per sale, right? So now you're looking at a commission-based a commission developer, right. you know, fueling why they're going to build this because they think that they're going to sell a boatload of tre treadmills. Yeah, that's right. right. So, and I mean, Microsoft was, sides. yeah, Microsoft's being criticized now for, oh, they're, well, if you want an app, well, pay, they're paying people to develop the apps, right? And that's not always a good sign. You have to pay someone to develop the app instead of them wanting to develop. But, you know, don't, don't be so quick to criticize. So did Android in the beginning, a lot of people forget. It was, oh, Android, you know, you know, well, you know they're, they're paying developers, particularly the big companies, to develop apps for Android. Because Android had the same problem when it came out. Remember, Android had a market share of zero <laughs> at one point. And Apple, was, how dominant was Apple? You're going to challenge Apple? So, you know, yes, we are in a duopoly, but I'd also say my only experience in the last four years in this market is <laughs> don't just think that the market's settled and that, like, nothing can happen. So that, from across... The, the, yeah, please. One final point, I, I think Microsoft do have an opportunity. If they can resolve their... The discrepancy between what was an, you know, originally a, a smartphone to a tablet to a, to a desktop, kind of, that spectrum is now blurred so significantly. Really, it's really a continuous spectrum. Small, and even now to the kind of Google Gear, uh, sorry, um, uh, Samsung Gear. So th there is no hard lines, and therefore, if they can actually answer the question around productivity tools and get the message correct about how there's productivity tools, because again, if you look, look at downloads, take out the social, me social media apps, productivity apps are now are, are the Absolutely. places that really drive um, people for usage on device, not downloads. I've got 47 apps on my phone, I use four of them, right? But the usage is, is the productivity. So if they can answer that, and they can sort out their, their answers around the productivity tools they have yeah. across that spectrum, then I think they have a point. Um, I know a lot of people are developing apps out here, so let's help them. We've talked about the, the, the different uh, native platforms, we've talked about mobile web. You know, how are you guys dealing with the fragmentation problem in terms of development? You know, there's companies like AppCelerator out there that offer a platform, but in actual cross-platform development, making it more efficient, making it easier, what tools are you using? What technologies are you using? How are you making cross-platform, regardless of what the mix is, iOS, Android, mobile web? How, how are you dealing with that internally? What, any, any specific companies, tools, technologies, platforms that you use to? I mean, I'll start. We actually used Accelerator. They're from Atlanta. They were based in Atlanta originally. They started here. Uh, we used them in the early days. They've since moved to the West Coast. But we used them originally um, and obviously bought into the, to the dream and we're friends with those guys. And I think they're, they certainly have a, a really nice business. But it's, it's actually, we found six months in that it's actually much easier to just build each one native. That This kind of cross-platform, at least for us, it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. We ended up doing just as much work 
um, to try to retrofit it for Android or whatever. And so, so we, I've also found this, and this, this kind of uh, amazed me like two years ago when we hired a young developer who had never developed for iOS before. He had an interest in it. And in four weeks, he was literally a smart developer, a good developer, but in four weeks, he was, I'd say he was as good as any developer like in Atlanta, yeah. you know, in terms of for developing iOS. And so I think the learning curve is, um, is not nearly as much as it used to be. So, I mean, we just, we just do it all, all native, no cross-platform, and it seems to, there doesn't seem to be a time lag at all. It, it, we've used oh, sorry. Uh, we, we've used them all. Um, you know, it, they all have pros and cons. It's like you know, are you, are you nailing in a hammer? You know, what kind? Of, are you nail, put in a nail? What kind of hammer do you want to use? How big is the nail? You know, that kind of. Yeah. So they they all have pros and cons. We weigh them for different use cases, different budgets. Clients have different budgets. They have different needs. Uh, so from mobile web to to tools like Accelerator. Uh, to native development. Uh, what we're focused on is user experience, at least that's the strength of our agency. So it's, it's regardless of the OS or you have to take that into account, but it's, it's more where, where is the user? You know, you guys, you guys focused on this and it's where is the user? What do they have in their pocket? And you know, what's, the, what's the most intuitive way to get done? And we'll figure out the technology uh, based on your budget, based on your timeline. They, there's plenty of options. Carl and Dave, yeah. I think it's the same. I think the if the challenge you're having is looking at the cost of your business and fragmentation of the multiple platforms that you're developing for, then that's really more indicative of a problem elsewhere in your organization. The cost of the development piece is really minor compared to what you should be spending and the process you should have in place around understanding what product you're delivering, who you're delivering it to, the value that you're delivering and going to gain from it. And then the, the way that that is encapsulated and handed into development and the, 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 the methodology using around it, then the testing and the deployment of it. The development part itself should be fairly minor. So if, if, if that fragmentation of multiple platforms is creating an issue for you, I would probably kind of challenge you to look elsewhere mm -hmm. in, in your organization to understand why that cost is so high. Yeah, don't start there. Like, don't start at, oh, what am I going to build on? Start yeah, at, stop. why am I building? What's Absolutely. the best way to build it? Yeah. I mean, it, when, when you look at cross-platform, my, my whole uh, experience has been they're almost like, like Sherpas. They can get you 60% of the way there, right? But you look at the, 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 the difference between, you know, uh, value on one hand and experience on the other, I don't think any brand, you know, out there is going to want to sacrifice experience. Right, so so we, we handle all that internally. Yeah. Now, if your budget is incredibly low, you're just starting out, then then there's solutions out there that can get you there at a low cost, pretty fast, and there's still a value. Yeah, uh, you know, in regards to you know, sort of app discovery, to switch to a slightly different topic, and you know, any secret sauce, you know, Scout Mob, obviously, you know, this earned media discussion, it's word of mouth, and. <clears throat> You know, as you knew how to get the app discovered and you're hoping it's going to be word of mouth, but did you learn any tricks along the way in terms of, you know, if someone writes an article about you, that's great, or if someone's word of mouth, but any, any way to, to sort of uh, drive word of mouth or get that app discovered? I mean, if you, if you, have any, if you know the answers, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> I don't think there's any shortcuts. Um, I mean, we, we were just on the West Coast last week. We're, we're raising money right now. And I mean, that's the number one question that everyone asks is, is around acquisition. <laughs> How much you need? 50 million. <laughs> um, so acquisition is the number one question. And, and the biggest companies in the world are having, I mean, it's, it's a problem that we all face. Um, we, we have 2 million subscribers, just, just under 2 million subscribers. And, and every single one of them, for the most part, I'd say 95% of it is word of mouth. And, um, and so, I mean, there's little tricks, but I mean, I think for us, the trick was spend a lot of time on, on what we're good at, which was the product. Yeah. And, and, you know, your word of mouth slide, that's, that's us. Um, so it's funny, I, I feel like there's these windows in time where certain things work. There, you'll, 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 every once in a while, you'll read of companies that social was a big driver for them, or, or there was little w windows in time where things worked, and then everyone jumps in, and then that's not working anymore, yeah. and the cost goes up. So I, I think if you're smart um, and, and you're, you're opportunistic, I think there's probably some windows where you could take advantage of things, yeah. but there's nothing for over a three-year period of time that consistently works, because mm -hmm. that's going to start getting yeah. expensive. And the rest, of the, gonna rest of the panel, I fully endorse the you know, shortcuts rule, but are there any, you know, what have we learned in terms of leveraging social or great PR or, you yeah. know, any, 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 not tricks, but just good smart strategies to get apps discovered? I, th I think the most uh, successful 
ones, like an Angry Birds and Scout Mob and Instagram, <clears throat> is because, it's not because they had a, a ton of money. Right. Uh, we know you guys didn't have a ton of money when you started out. You had enough. And, but the inherent nature of how your app works is in, in the context of sharing and in social and in shared experiences in the real world. And Instagram's the same way. Let me share the real world that I'm in through a digital platform and then everybody's like, what's this sexy photo you just threw up on Facebook? Let me find out how to get that. Um, and when we, even when we were doing stuff in the early days with you guys, it wasn't even about app downloads, it was about email addresses mm -hmm. and about just the, the brand proposition of what you guys were bringing and that backed into to app downloads. You know, so it, it's a bit, is, it, is an app you use as a utility privately? If so, you're gonna have an uphill battle and you better have a good CRM, really good PR, a boatload of money. Yeah, right. So I mean, there's, there's the general tactics, right? You want to put out a press release. You want to make sure that it's, uh, it's speaking to all the, all the good that your app is going to do. You want to leverage your social platforms uh, to, uh, to leverage your, your own approach. From a paid piece, um, there's a lot of ways to you know, crawl to the top of the, you know, of the, of the top listings, you know, featured apps within, within iTunes on the iOS side. Um, Facebook with their, click to, you know, their, their app download piece. And it gets out of that kind of minutia that the, the app stores have. Right. Like, where do you start, right? Like, that's like yeah. walking into a field of flowers and finding out, you know, where's the perfect one? Yeah. But on Facebook, you know, they're picking out that one flower, going to people based on their, their <clears throat> precise interests and topic levels. So it helps, you know, users like us, you know, see the forest for the trees. Right? So it's a different approach to getting it in front of people. It's more about, you know, paid targeting. Uh, on that side of the fence, but you have to put it all together and shake it up and see what works. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I, we've got about less than 10 minutes, so I um, think about a question. We're going to go to the audience next so we can get the mic ready. I, I, I want to quickly touch on just connected TVs. I mean, are we seeing, you know, is it going to take Apple to get in the market to truly transform consumer behavior, but are we seeing anything? Connected TVs and apps and, and any evidence of people using their, their connected TVs to, uh, to, to look for apps and use apps. I guess we could consider, consider Netflix an app, but I'm not mm -hmm. really talking about that. I'm talking a little bit more sort of, you know, more I think be a, like that. The, the, the kind of concept of, of second screen devices and second screen apps, whilst there was that kind of, if you look at the embryonic stage that, that went through, it was very much driven <clears> around. You can see that, you can, I'll give you a digital um, kind of TV guide and some additional information. That's going to grow more and more, I think. So as well as the TV itself being connected, it's more the experience of a second screen, a second device whilst in that uh, position. And I think as the hardware improves, as the technology improves, you're going to see that move out from just in the home yeah. to second screen device whilst you're in other experiences, sporting stadiums, concerts. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Well, you know, again, when I, just last week, <clears throat> excuse me, in New York, um, there's a gentleman from AT&T, and he was talking about, very bullishly, he was looking at everybody straight ahead. Look, we've got 100 million people on uh, cable, internet, we've got 70 million on uh, mobile app subscribers, and, you know, we've got, we've got phone service, we all, and we can now tie all this together, and we can know what you watched, and what you DVR'd, and then what website you went to on your mobile device, and then what you went to as, you know, through UVerse on your ISP. And he was so excited, and then somebody raised and said, Oh, so you can do, you can do this tomorrow? Like, I've, I've got some media done. Well, he's like, no, well, not exactly. Like, we're still fitting it together. So I think the promise is there. I think, you know, I bought a Google TV, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, it was built in. And, and it's really cool and exciting. Um, and I think the biggest thing that pins back from a marketer standpoint and agency standpoint is what you said at the beginning, which is uh, media budgets and media, the ability to target a, yeah. across that cross-platform targeting a specific person no matter where they are. And that's where it's going to come together. Anyone else briefly on the TVs? One thing I'll add is, I mean, the smartphone is the new remote. It just is. So, I mean, when you think of what that other screen can do, I think the, the possibilities are endless. But you start to see even cable companies like, like, um, like Xfinity, you know, I can change the channel on any TV in my home from Costa Rica. Right. right? And right. really piss off my wife. But, I mean, you can do that. You can lock your car door. Why should you Costa Rica with it was business quiet. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> um, they were a client. Um, but no, it's, it's um, I mean, you can do anything from right here, right? I can record Scandal that's airing this Thursday, right now. Yeah. Right? So all these things are, 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 um, are kind of making our lives going back to simplicity, uh, making it easier for us to do things that we want to do. Yeah, the cable companies take a big hit, and every now and then I got my, my tablet here. Mm -hmm. um, but on my Samsung, you know, I have Time Warner Cable. I have a Time Warner Cable app on here, and I can watch yeah. TV. 
And it's expensive. And the big, the big thing with cable and all that, it's expensive. It's, people don't necessarily complain about the service much anymore, but their app is fantastic. You know, I yeah. can be anywhere. Well, I've got a connection. I can watch my Time Warner cable. I can, and I can set my DVR. All right, so let's get to the, uh, we can talk here all day, but um, let's get to the audience for, uh, for a question. Bring it on. There we go. Bill Keane from ISG. <laughs> With the Don't lovely intro. Is, <laughs> is this just because yeah. I did This is going to be a tough session? one, guys. This is going to be a tough one. Really? Get ready. And if you can briefly introduce yourself. Brace yourself. Well. Introduce myself? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Bill Keane, uh, Mobile Solutions at Intercontinental Hotels Group. First of all, Michael, I'm great to have you here. You're, you're the kind of vibe this town needs. And uh, so I want to say thank you. I'm a big Scott Muff fan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yes. The B2C tech <laughs> darling of Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, but now the hard question. So, um, you know, in e-tail and other areas, a lot of uh, concern around showrooming and mobile just being used to drive down price. Um, what kind of metrics do you see on return visit and loyalty and uh, things when people maybe go in and use Scout Lob on a discount, but do they come back on full retail? Have you seen our product roadmap? It sounds like <laughs> you have. We, we actually, we're thinking a lot about uh, showrooming to answer the first part. Uh, we're actually thinking a lot about that on, in the shop business. Um, and so we think there's some pretty disruptive things around retail. Uh, these retail stores, a lot of them are reaching out to us. These are bricks and mortar retail stores that sell goods. So non kind of traditional Scout Mob deals. And they're reaching out to us around kind of showrooming and, and uh, is there something on the e-commerce side? I mean, they're not e-commerce experts and they need a lot of help there. So um, we, we, you know, we've, we spend a lot of time debating that topic around showrooming and we're, we have some, uh, I think, pretty interesting plans there. But in terms of uh, repeat business, I mean, that was the promise of, I think Groupon probably had a year or two where they kind of, that was their sales pitch always around, um, you know, we're driving people in, I get it, you're not making money the first time, but you will eventually. Our promise was, was not that. It wasn't around the, the return traffic. Not that that wasn't going to be the case. Because I know as a consumer, I was introduced to a lot of businesses that I hadn't been to before, and if it was good, I'd go back. Um, but our promise was always that on the first transaction, they were going to at least break even. And so the first transaction was not a loss leader for them. And so that was a big part of our sales pitch, still is. Um, and so we think we thought a lot about that and making the metrics the first time makes sense uh, And then we wouldn't have as much pressure driving them back Ultimately the pressure driving them back is is fairly simple now the businesses don't like to hear this But every time I've ever used this got my deal and I've probably used a hundred of them over the last four years if the place was, was good, it was on the place. It was, Scout Mob was out of the picture at that point. Mm -hmm. we, we, we brought you in there, we got you in the door, um, but if the food's good, the service is good, the atmosphere is good, then, then you'll, you'll judge the place based on that. And, um, and so it's a lot on them. I think they all want this kind of um, silver bullet of we drove them in there and then Scout Mob's gonna miraculously you know, do something after the fact and turn them into a little customer forever and that just didn't happen. We tried actually a bunch of loyalty tests, not a bunch, we tried a couple. We did a partnership with First Data and we tried to do some loyalty stuff. But loyalty at a business is really, really tough. And I haven't seen anyone actually that's really figured out loyalty in a, in a systematic way. Because if the place isn't good, it doesn't matter how much of a discount you're getting, you're not coming back. You can get them in there once, but not return. A time for one more, I think. Answered all your questions. Oh, man. All right, so big round of applause for our panelists here. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good time. They just want to stay on stage, apparently. Good time. <laughs> Thank you.